Welcome to the MCAT Basics Podcast, brought to you by the physicians at Med School Coach. Each week, Sam Smith breaks down high yield MCAT topics so you can score as high as possible on test day. Welcome to a bonus episode of MCAT Basics. I'm joined by Dr. Luke Maxfield, who is a graduate of Lake Erie Osteopathic School of Medicine. He is currently a dermatology resident, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the osteopathic experience. So, um, you know, first of all, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Looking forward to it. So the first thing I I wanted to ask you about was, you know, lately, have you been getting more questions about kind of what it means to be a DO? Uh, probably less. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. 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 I think, I think less because, um, I, especially with the, the merger. So if anyone just doesn't know, there's like a merger, I think it took effect 2020 or, uh, or maybe even yes, yeah, finalized at this point, I suppose yeah, yeah. where we have one accrediting body. Um, but you know, for the last probably five or 10 years, I think DOs have been much more in the public space. Um, I think there's even been some controversy about the president's physician also being a DO. Yeah. Uh, But that's like a recurring theme. And I I honestly think in the professional world, everybody's kind of familiar with the presence. And honestly, just we're a lot more uh, numerous than I would as a group, I think, than we were probably 25 years ago. So I guess for the general public, you know, there are a lot of different providers out there now altogether. And so I think degrees are actually altogether not as face forward as they used to be. And so I think I'm getting just less questions from every front, whether general public or from other professionals. Sure. Yeah. We got, you know, uh, one of our pages on uh, perspectivedoctor.com is, you know, kind of describes the differences between MD and DO. And right after everything with the president's physician, like it, it went from maybe a hundred page views a day to like 10,000. <laughs> so that's why I'm asking like literally like hundred X difference there so it was it was kind of crazy that's actually pretty funny <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of silly but it's like you know it, it is it is a little bit funny yeah but it's fair i'm i always think that's yeah. like a very fair question i'm i'm a pretty candid person so i'll be pretty upfront with people especially on a personal cool. level about um about things about that agrees yeah so let's start there so kind of you know maybe give me a little background on your your background in medicine, but kind of why you chose DO, um, you know, then maybe we can get into the differences between MD and DO. Yeah. Uh, so my background is uh, I didn't see a doctor consistently until I was probably, I think, 20 years old. Medicine was just like not a part of my life. And then I got meningitis, um, aseptic or viral, probably since I'm still here without any problems. But, um, you know, I, honestly, at that point, I'd only seen kind of, you know, the alternative provider field. And uh, I remember I'd... Um, just kind of been around like seeing people no one really knew what was going on i just felt super sick my neck was super stiff and then you know as soon as i walked into the er because it just got that bad it, within five seconds oh yeah you have meningitis you know and something clicked with me then that there was a lot of value in being able to have um, like a very factual knowledge base and to have something reproducible and it was at that point that i kind of started looking into uh, medicine altogether so like i'm 20 years old right and i'm just now turning the pages into getting into um, the sphere of like being a medical professional. And so at that point, I had already gone, uh, what, through junior college, probably for five years, just kind of burning time, doing everything I wanted to do in life. And so uh, I took an atypical route to going into medicine. You know, I had a, like a huge sandbag of average GPAs. Um, and so with that, you know, I think the DO applicant is either one coming from a more holistic alternative background where they feel like the chiropractic kind of skill set, the manipulative skill set that the DO schools do still teach um, is something they would want to incorporate into their practice or they like the idea of it kind of having a more holistic mindset. And so they funnel that way or they're kind of a non-traditional applicant where, um, uh, you know, where they're coming from a different background. And, you know, in all candor, like historically becoming a DO has been easier than becoming an allopathic physician. And uh, so I think you kind of have that route. Now, I think that's changing. And I've pulled a lot of data actually to kind of take a look at where that stands now. Um, But I think those are the two spheres. And for me personally, it was like a combination of both. Like my background, I never saw a doctor. I only saw kind of that alternative sphere. And I was like, okay, you know, I still, I liked some of what they have to offer and obviously 
this natural side of medicine is becoming huge today. That's this complementary and alternative medicine is one of the most prevalent sources that people are looking for uh, in their healthcare. And so for me, it just kind of made sense to couple that with what I found to be like factual Western medicine and try to marry that. Um, and then also too, like I had, again, just like baggage of GPA, where if I had gone to school for like 10 more years, my GPA wouldn't budge. I just had so many credits. <laughs> and so I see. traditionally, like the applicants have, are like, um, you know, th either their GPA is just a little bit less than an MD applicant or their MCAT was like a little bit less. Again, I don't necessarily think that's quite holding as true anymore. But, yeah, what does uh, that look like now? Is that do you yeah, have it so in front of you right now? I actually do. Nice. I've got a lot of notes here. I was ready for. I thought because I, I think this is interesting. I right. Yeah. So like, I'm in a competitive specialty. I'm actually a competitive person by nature, and so I really like. I like to learn, like to practice with a little chip on my shoulder to make, be the best that I can be. I don't want to see how as a profession, like we're stacking up. So, yeah. um, there's a really there's some really nice sites out there that just kind of put this uh, up side by side, and let's see here. And it ranks all of the U.S. medical schools based off of their um, GPA, average GPA of college students or whatever prospective medical students coming in, and then also mm -hmm. their MCAT scores. Okay. And so if you can, if you organize it by list, you know, the averages aren't that different. Like I think mm -hmm. the averages for both schools are above a 3.4. And then there are individual schools that fall like at 3.4, 3.5 across both specialties. And then both schools boast scores as high as the GPA of like an average GPA for the accepted students of 3.7. Hmm. Um, but when you stratify it, the DOs, I think, are like more like a 3.5 or 3.6. And then the MD is like 3.6, 3.7. So it's really close. So there's uh, a mixture. The, so the, the, the top, you know, the top 10% DO schools, where do you think that would fit with like the, the medical schools? Does they, excuse me, they... DO schools fit with the MD schools. So right. would, where would the top 10 DO schools fit amongst the MD schools? So it's know? interesting because, you know, if we just stratify it purely based off of MCAT yeah. scores and GPA, they're probably going to, the, there's a couple of DO programs um, in Texas uh, and uh, some other locations that really do boast some good numbers. And so I think they fall within like the top 25 okay. of all together schools in the country. And there's only like 37 DO schools. So okay. Um, they fall within the top 25 probably programs across the country altogether as far as how they rank in their objective oh, wow. GPAs and board scores. But at the same time, <laughs> GPA and MCAT score probably doesn't mean that much for being a doctor. So this actually brings me to my next question is, you know, kind of, what are some of the differences you've noticed between yourself being a DO and MDs? I'm sure there's some in your residency program. Are there anything that you can really pick out and say, wow, this is something I learned during um, my, my DO training? So anecdotally, and uh, something that I think they, sorry, anecdotally and something I think they often kind of talk about within the osteopathic sphere is because so much of our training in our first two years is hands-on, like manipulative medicine, I feel you know, we're told, and I actually think this is anecdotally true that we're, we're very comfortable being around people and like, you know, it's not, uh, and, and I guess, you know, with the physical exam portion of medicine, just talking to people, you know, putting a hand on their shoulder, um, just being there physically, uh, and communicating with them. Now, of course, that's extremely anecdotal, so extremely subjective. And, <laughs> uh, but I think that is something that does correlate just because of how much of our early years are spent hands-on um, now, as far as like how it's actually practiced uh, and what it actually looks like, it's, there's almost no distinguishing difference in most specialties. Um, I mean, in the allopathic students, I mean, I don't know. There's just, it, it's a very, very blended line at this point. Yeah. I don't and know. I feel, I, I might be shooting in, into the dark with this, but I feel like most of your training probably comes in you know, your, your residency and maybe in your third and fourth years of, of school where they're kind of, it's basically the same thing. I guess it's, it's is it the same all four years except for the manip manipulation part of it? Right. Yeah. So for most programs, and there are some variations with this, but the first two years of medical school will usually be purely academic. And so obviously you're pretty much at your institution just doing whatever curriculum they have in place. Um, and so it's during that time that, you know, the DO would have their own unique academic 
experience where they are doing manipulation and um, osteopathic principles, tenets, and a lot of, a lot, a lot of like anatomy and physiology, the musculoskeletal anatomy and physiology. But yeah, after that, third year, fourth year of medical school, um, residencies, years one through nine, um, you know, it's all, it's all combined and under a joint accrediting body. And so I think at that point, I mean, the majority of your matter. training is done jointly. Yeah. Um, so I want, to ask you, I want to ask you about these manipulations that you've been talking about. Kind of what, what is that? What does that look like? <laughs> it looks like chiropractics. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, just for everybody who is like even considering what is this at all, you know, it's yeah. very much like chiropractics because so osteopathic medicine was started by an MD um, in the 1890s. And it would be a shame, I think, for everybody if I didn't like know the exact year. It is 1892. <laughs> <laughs> so A.T. Stills, uh, he was a medical doctor and he made this offshoot of medicine at the time where there really wasn't a lot of science based uh, anything, probably. And so one of his focus and tenets was um, that basically the function of the body was reciprocally based with the structure. And so we're, we look in that area of our scope as to like a lot of physiologic problems, especially musculoskeletal, can stem from some sort of axial problem. Basically, your bones can cause problems in your muscles and the rest of your body. And, and so there's like the somatic relationship between our organs and then um, the structure of our body. And so the manipulations are targeting the structure of the body to try to have some end response elsewhere. Um, and I, I personally feel like that kind of is in line with more modern day chiropractics as well, where they're, you know, we'll, we'll adjust necks, same similar maneuvers, not exact same, but very similar maneuvers as a traditional chiropractor would do. We'll adjust the spine, the back, whether it's high velocity techniques where you get that traditional like crack and pop, or whether it's like fascial release, effleurage, soft tissue manipulation. Um, so it's kind of a spectrum, but it's anywhere from massage to chiropractics. Now, do you, I'm, I'm assuming that, I mean, do you use it for derm or is there specialties, <laughs> is there specialties that use it more than others? Yeah, there's definitely specialties okay. where it's, it's more amenable to using your osteopathic skill set. So for dermatology, it's like kind of like a, um, a thoughtful response in that, yeah, sure. You could theoretically, you know, use it to manipulate lymphatics um, because, you know, lymphatics are intimately involved with the skin and some of the disease processes therein. Um, but realistically, we're, the majority of the dermatologic scope is not um, going to be using the osteopathic scope. Whereas like family practice, they really have a really nice opportunity to use something like that. Where instead of, you know, going to see your chiropractor and going to see your doctor, you get to see your doctor who does chiropractics and he's trained in the scope of pharmaceutical pharmacy and also even like basic surgery. Right, right. So when you're applying to residency programs, is it through the same application process that, or that's what's being combined, right? Correct. Yeah. So historically okay. there have been, okay, so. You go ahead. All right. And I'll, okay. So it's kind of been one-sided in that DOs had their own residency programs historically that they could apply to, and they could apply to the MD allopathic mm. programs. MDs, however, could only apply to the allopathic programs. And so the DOs had this nice like pool that wasn't big enough to fill their spots probably, but a nice pool of residency spots and they could apply to MD spots. But now, yes, it's all combined. And so the application process is exactly the same. You're using the same, same um, electronic bodies and organizations uh, to which you're submitting your application and it just funnels to, to everybody. How do you think that's going to affect residencies for uh, DOs and, and MDs? Will there be any changes now that it's combined? I mean, overall, do you see any, anything happening? Not directly. So, okay. and the reason I say that is because, um, you know, the only side that would change based off of the logic of having it have, having been one-sided before is the MDs might have access to spots they wouldn't have had otherwise. Now, with that being said, there are just very few DO spots anyways. So like for dermatology, I mean, we're talking like 30 programs. So it's a competitive specialty. And so MDs will have access to those small subset of programs that they did in any way. Um, but it probably won't be meaningful as far as who's going who's gonna to match and go where between the groups. In general, the thing I always try to say to our students and certainly prospective students, people desire the product coming out of the DO schools. And we hear very, very positive feedback from program directors and institutions that 
for a long time have been accepting VO students. And certainly the stories about them becoming leaders and practitioners in those institutions. That was a clip from the Perspective Doctor podcast with the CEO and president of the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine, or AACOM. The Perspective Doctor podcast is great. It features weekly interviews with interesting doctors and different figures in medicine. If you're a pre-med or medical student, I I highly recommend it. And I really do listen every week and I feel like I'm learning something new and, and valuable with each episode. So if you're looking for a new podcast, go search Prospective Doctor Podcast in your podcasting app and take a listen. So in terms of residency programs, then we'll we'll just talk about kind of the old system. When you were applying to residencies, and I guess you don't have the opposite experience to really compare this to, but would you say it is more competitive, less competitive, the same competitiveness as, you know, applying to an MD residency program? Um, So I... that's a great question. And we always kind of thought about that within our own sphere. And so it, it probably is in that if you're talking about a competitive specialty, you're probably taking from the same percentile of applicants. If, if it was purely DO and MD is totally split, I think you would probably be taking from like the upper five percentile of DOs into a particular competitive specialty that would have traditionally been an osteopathic residency. Uh, where similarly, I think in the MD pool, you would probably be pulling from the same percentile of applicants uh, into that competitive specialty. It would just be a larger number because there were just more of them. Oh, I see. Right. And you said there's 36, 37? Uh, I think there's 37 DO schools. Okay. How many MD schools are there? <laughs> um, like, there's like a, more than 100, obviously. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah. You know, I actually don't know that one. I didn't look that one up. But there's definitely more than 100. Yeah, I'm not even going to look it up. I, I, bet it's, I bet it's somewhere north of 150, if I had to guess. A fair guess. Um, so, what, so there's this news that, you know, step one might go past fail. Um, it's not confirmed, I don't think. I don't really know. It seems a little bit like a black no, hole. No, I think it's is it not only confirmed, but it's taking place soon. It's going to be implemented here soon. It is? If not, okay. If not this year. It's, it's very... What, where is it? what year is it? 2020, 2021, maybe next yeah. year. Okay. So with that they, said, then go ahead. Now, once they committed, they committed to this thing. I, it surprised me <laughs> because there was a lot of rumor and talk about this before it happened. And so I was like, oh, this is interesting. Let's pay attention to this. And so, you know, I thought, you know, maybe they'll strat- maybe they'll meet in the middle and stratify into quartiles. Like, okay, so you don't want people to have a score. So maybe you'll stratify them based off of their quartile and then a fail group. But they really just committed and went past fail. And that was a big, big step and a big move. Yeah. So how's that going to affect residency applications? So okay, of the questions you sent me, <laughs> when I saw this, I thought, whoa, he asked this question. Because this is actually a huge deal, especially if this is only the first step in the direction of medicine. Um, and so I always start... That this topic off with this caveat and that I think mm-hmm. it was well-intentioned in that I think their goals were probably twofold. And I know they've made some statements to kind of talk about why they did this, but one, one of this was to um, kind of alleviate the burden and stress and pressure of having an initial scored test. Um, and then two, to, uh, I, I think partly also push more emphasis onto the clinical skill set because I think there may be some questions as to whether the basic sciences correlate as well to how you're going to perform as like your step two, um, which is a more clinically based test. Okay. And so, I'll, you know, always give them the benefit of the doubt. And I know this was probably in response to a lot of people's uh, desires. They wanted this to move past fail. And so people responded in kind. But the implications of this um, are, are uh, multifactorial. And here's some... <laughs> data to like support my thought process here. So I pulled, so the last uh, program director survey that I could find was the 2018 program director survey. Mm -hmm. And so this is when they asked program directors, okay, what's important to you? What are you looking for in your prospective residents, the people you're going to be interviewing and accepting into your residency program? Because for a doctor, this is everything. Like your scope of practice is determined by your residency. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this was broken into multiple parts, but the two I'm, I'll focus on are one, what's important for who they're going to interview. And then two, what's important for how they're going to rank people who they have already interviewed. So basically okay. you get a pool of people you interview and then you rank them in a matter of like, you know, one through 15, one is the person I want the most, 15 is the person I want, but they're just 15. Um, 
So when you're selecting who you're going to interview, the most important things in order, in descending order, were the USMLE one complex one, then letters of recommendation, then a dean's letter, and then the USMLE two complex two. And so that's who they're going to interview. Now, once you've interviewed, then they take other factors into consideration. So after you've made the interview, then their list looks like this. Personal interactions, interpersonal skills, feedback from residents, USMLE 1, letters of rec, hmm. USMLE 2. Interesting. Um, and so a consistent thing is that the objective measure that you would have, other than just like letting them get to know you, is the USMLE 1. And so if you lose that opportunity to put something out there, um, like a strong board score, kind of as a reflection, hopefully, of one, your capacity and two, your work ethic, then it's going to fall to um, either your USMLE 2. And that's okay. That's fine. That's still an objective measure you can put a lot into. And, you know, a lot of people rely heavily on this to, to shine. Like this, they want this to be a part of their resume that really makes them stand out, you know, if they don't go to a prestigious school, um, if they don't have connections with high profile people from which they can get a letter of recommendation um, or a high profile dean where they can get a strong letter of recommendation with name recognition. Um, so, you know, the US only two would still be there, yeah, but a lot of people will score okay on one and score excellent on another. So if you have one test now, it really puts a lot of pressure on this one test. So now everybody right. has the USMLE 2. That's your one shot. There's no forgiveness. Like, you don't, you can't, you can't improve. You can't go up from there <laughs> to try, try to prove yourself. Um, and so let's Scary. say that. Yeah, it is. It's a lot of pressure for people. Yeah. So while I think they're trying to take pressure off the front end, I think they inadvertently put pressure on the second test. Mm -hmm. um, but even more than that, let's say the USMLE 1 still pass fail. Because a lot of um, your letters of recommendation are going to be coming from within your institution, especially because you're getting them in the first two years of, or some of them from your first two years, or your program affiliated hospitals, which is going to be a large part of your third year of medical school, um, the strength of your letters of recommendation, at least in like name recognition um, with high profile figures, is probably going to be based off of where you go to medical school. And so then a lot of pressure actually gets shifted to the MCAT now too. Hmm. And I know there's actually been a big push to kind of like, you know, let these applicants do a year of life before they come into medical school. You know, do they really need to be doing volunteer work and getting letters of recommendation like during middle, middle school? Um, but they inadvertently shifted actually more pressure to people at a younger age um, because going to a good medical school is going to mean a lot now. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And then, uh, Oh, and then the last, the last part of that I wanted to say is something called audition rotations. So an audition rotation is um, you spend time rotating as a medical student at a place you would probably like to go. And it's usually done at a remote site. Let's say I'm based out of Texas and I want to go to UCLA in California. So I would take, let's say, two weeks to a month to fly to UCLA to work in their hospital system, get to know people within the program. And that's a way people compensate for... Um, not compensate. That's the way that people kind of complement their application to get get these some of these other features to get people to know your face, know how you interact with them, get an idea of your interpersonal skills, and get to know the residents of the program. Um, because that's that's going to be very important, especially without a USMLE one. Now, a problem is if you, again, if you don't have these objective markers, so much emphasis, especially if you're not at a high profile place, is going to be placed on your relationships with people, not like that they're going to take you because they like personally care about you or it's some intimate relationship, but because they know you as a person and they believe that you have something to offer as a person into their program. And so I think a lot of people are going to actually spend a lot more of their effort and monetary investment into these audition rotations. And they're expensive. Hmm. I did those um, on the dermatology trail. I mean, and if, you, if you think about living out of a hotel or a VRB <laughs> O for like a month on end for one institution. Sounds <laughs> Sounds so very horrible. That's, that's another downside. Um, so interesting. I'd almost rather have, it sounds like you would too. I'd almost rather have like an objective score that I could put all my time and focus into and like work really hard and, and, and great, get a great, you know, step one score. Then I, I guess you can do the other things through hard work, but it just doesn't seem quite 
that way. Is that right? Yeah, it's it was something somewhat predictable, you know. It, it's like a test, you know. If you put in the work on the back end, if you're consistent over the year, you know, you can probably expect a decent score, and you hope that it reflects the effort you put in. Um, you know, the, the thing that I think all the pro, a lot of these programs didn't like is, you know, and it's true, um, you know, we would as pro, prospective applicants be spending a lot of our time during our clinical rotations just wanting to read, like we just want to study for the test. Like we're less invested in what's going on in front of us and we're more invested in what's going on in a book, which is actually a really big downside. Um, but there is definitely inherent value in having some sort of objective marker, I think, especially for someone like a DO who, whose program is either newer or doesn't have any name recognition or for an international medical graduate yeah. who's coming in and is really wanting to just drop a bomb, put, put something down on paper that's just yeah. emphatic. Right. Um, it's, it's it like really on the M it's like if you have a low GPA, right? And you're trying to get into medical school. Um, one way to do that is to kill the MCAT and, you know, get in the 95th percentile. Um, and now if you took the MCAT away, it just, it, it seems like it limits people, but, um, I guess there's pluses, pluses and minuses to, to both, to, to both of those things. So, yeah. At med school coach, we know that getting into medical school is hard. In fact, 60% of pre-meds who apply to a medical school don't even get accepted. And if you want to get accepted into a top medical school, it's even harder. That's why more students than ever are turning to MCAT Tutoring by Med School Coach. Our tutors are all 99th percentile scorers, have been through rigorous training, and can help raise your MCAT score by 12 points or more. You need every competitive advantage you can get to get into med school. So why not get one-on-one -on -one tutoring from Med School Coach? Our expert team will create a custom program just for you and help you master MCAT content where you need the help most. You'll raise your MCAT score. We guarantee it. Visit us online at medschoolcoach.com and use offer code PODCAST10 to save 10% up to $400 on a Med School Coach MCAT tutoring package. You can achieve your medical school dreams and Med School Coach can help. All right, so let me just bring it back to uh, DO here. Mm -hmm. What would you tell a student who's trying to figure out whether they want to apply to a DO school, whether they want to apply to an MD school and just, you know, is trying to figure out what they want to do? What would you, what would you tell them? All right. So this is like an amazing question because it's kind of difficult. Um, because the question is like, really like you, I think you laid out before me was just like, why would you, pick, would you pick a DO school? Like mm -hmm. when, what circumstance would you want to pick a DO school yeah. selectively? Um, and so I think then you have to consider, does being a DO provide you benefits over being an MD? And I would say if that skill set, the osteopathic like manipulative skill set isn't something you actually want to apply, then it may not. You know, we do tend, or at least historically, have been more ho uh, holistic in our approach. Um, but I think Western medicine is making the same move kind of reactively as society wants. Um, and so I don't they necessarily know, other than the skill set, if it provides you anything beneficial that you would select it over a medical, uh, an MD program. Um, but, and then the counter side, the other side of it is, is, does it limit you? Yeah. So does going to a DO school limit your ability to do the specialty you want to do, um, or even match at all? So I took a look at some more numbers just because I wanted to have some like strong objective data for Seems us. like you're and a numbers guy. Uh, I'm a fact uh, guy. guy. <laughs> fact guy. Okay, okay. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So the 2020 NRMP data, uh, they did, they took a look at the MD applicants and right now we're just going to talk about match rate overall. So look, not everybody who graduates medical gets to do a residency. Um, believe it or not, after like four years of hard work, not everybody actually gets to move on initially or right away. And so for the MDs out of 18,000 plus, uh, medical students, 93.7% matched into their first year position of residency. And then for DOs, um, 90.7 percent of the students match into residency programs. And so you're looking at 93.7 and 90.7, you know, I'd be willing to bet that's not statistically significant. Definitely didn't worry about running that. But I think realistically, if you're going to be trying to match into a residency program, it's probably not going to limit you into getting into a residency program in general. Now the counter side, the other point, the other side of that is, is it going to limit you, your options into getting into a competitive specialty? Um, and that's a little harder to uh, really look at objectively because then you get into like, well, how are you going to stratify a competitive specialty? Like, I don't want to 
I don't want to make other specialties look less desirable sure. because I'm saying they're not competitive. <laughs> uh, but I think the reality of the matter is it probably would limit you a little bit because historically a lot of the competitive specialties, you know, they do want to take someone with a nice pedigree, whether it's a pedigree in research, um, a pedigree a pro coming from a program with a nice history of strong um, physicians coming out of there. And, you know, as a DEO, you, you do have to kind of have something to prove. Um, you need to put something down on paper or personally that's going to resonate with people. And, and so you may find yourself in somewhat of an uphill battle, um, at least in the near future, going to competitive specialties. But it's definitely not at all a limiting factor. Like just this year in the dermatology world, I feel like, again, this is anecdote. But uh, I saw so many people going into traditionally allopathic dermatology programs. Um, and I think, again, we're just kind of getting to a point where, you know, we're just kind of like physicians as opposed to like osteopaths and allopaths. And there's a little bit more camaraderie there and just like recognition than I think there was um, with previous generations. Sure. Um, so this last question I don't know how interested my crowd is going to be in this because, you know, my podcast is an MCAT podcast, but, um, you know, hopefully most of the people listening to it will eventually, will eventually make it into medical school. And, um, you know, what if you're, you're starting to take this step one or study for the step one. And at this point I'm, it'll be pass fail, but you know, you're starting to fail on it. Um, I know you're a tutor for USMLE step one, right? Is that right? Yeah. One, two, and three. One, two, and three. Okay. Um, so, you know, maybe talk briefly about what you do for tutoring and kind of, you know, what a tutor session looks like with you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you bet. Uh, first off, like uh, goals wise, never make it your goal to not fail, Then you're going to fail. <laughs> you're going to be that person who fails. So don't be that person. Um, in, on the same like program director uh, application of the thing, or a program director survey of the things that like have the most negative impact in their eyes. One of them, of course, is like failing your boards. It's not like it's going to, it's not going to screw you over for life. It's not like you're never going to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. You can definitely pass it, take it again and get a residency spot, but it really does carry a lot of weight. So you want to overshoot. Okay. Like you want to go in thinking you're going to be the 90th percentile. And then at worst you fall to 50th and who cares at that point, yeah. you were comfortable. Um, so, you know, set your goals high. Uh, but as far as tutoring, when I, when I meet with a person for the first time, I get an idea of where they're at. Like, what are your goals? What does your life look like right now? Um, are we just, are we trying to get you out of a hole that you're in? Are we trying to set you up for success? Or are you like a rock star who just wants to be even better? Um, and so I get an idea of what they are doing. And then I kind of look at uh, what they're preparing for, what their weaknesses are, and then what resources they're using. So there are like a million resource. We live in an information rich world and it carries over into medicine. So, um, you know, I just take a look at the resources. It usually ends up being like, you know, you probably don't need to buy more. You just need to kind of focus in on a couple. There's a ton of good ones. And then we build a schedule out. So I actually have like a Monday through Sunday schedule that I set up for people on an hourly basis. Like you're going to dedicate this time to reading, this time to questions, this time for something called sketchy pigmonic, where it's like just visual recognition for like medicines and infectious disease it's like new they're mnemonics right like uh no the pictures that, oh okay oh okay. yeah it's like a picture like visual mnemonics okay yeah i guess so something you close your eyes and you see <laughs> yeah someone um, was telling me about this like there's one where for a salmonella bacteria i don't know there's a plate and a picture of a lemon or something and you're supposed to remember that something with acid i don't know anyways <laughs> So someone was telling me about that, but continue. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, that's, I found I learned really well that way. That's so why I'm okay. a very visual learner. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, that's, that's my kind of thing. I love it. Anyway, so, so we set up that schedule. Look at your resources. What, how are you lock, allocating your time? Um, I try to build in a rest day for everybody because, look, you're, you're about to, for even for prospective medical students, you're about to embark in like an eight- to 10 to plus your journey like this is your life you have to have a life while you're doing this and as much as possible and you can definitely um, do all the work you need to do outside of clinical duties in like six days so try to teach them how to have a balanced life how to get their schedule going map out what their schedule look like and then um, that's number one so after that you know we'll catch up in a week or so touch base see if they met their goals make adjustments and then from there we go into like 
either topical things where they'll ask me, okay, I need to learn about the heart. Okay, let's talk about the heart for an hour. And we just talk about the physiology, the diseases, the treatment, or we'll do questions together. Like, are we game planning for the test now? And then we'll just open up a question. I'll see their train of thought. I'll have them verbalize it. I'll try to point out, highlight things that they're either doing or could do quicker, better, or features that they missed. And then we'll look at the discussion for the answer. We'll talk about that. I'll try to add in some snippets that weren't talked about in the answer discussion. Um, and I think that's really like most of what I do. Okay. Do you, do you expect to do more step two tutoring? Now? Yeah. The, the, the majority of my time is spent in step two tutoring, oh, it is. Okay. honestly, because okay. um, just like I said about the basic test, like step one, it's very basic science heavy. And so even though I 100% believe that is like the foundation of knowledge for a physician, like that's one thing that separates us after we can think of things from the cellular level through like the whole human body grossly functioning as a system. Mm -hmm. um, you really don't apply as much of those basic science things. And so um, the step two stuff, which is clinically based and on, I feel like that's a lot easier to recall and to um, continue to add on to because it, it's, you use it more often. Gotcha. Cool. Well, um, you got any, anything else? I think I've exhausted all my questions. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, for everyone who's out there like watching this, wanting to become a doctor, there is probably nothing to very few things in life that can be more fulfilling. So anyone who's like willing to take up this commitment and responsibility, I'm like, super passionate about helping them get there because it is just a privilege to be a part of something like this. Um, where you're interacting with people in an extremely meaningful way, even in my specialty, it make a big difference for people um, very visibly and even right in front of me. So, you know, just keep with it, stick with it. Uh, yeah. You have to have a goal in mind and see it through. So. Yeah. Well, thanks. Well, thanks for joining me. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Each episode of MCAT Basics is brought to you by Med School Coach. To access med school coach services, including MCAT tutoring and medical school admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for the MCAT, and we hope you tune in again next time.